Hi, this is Introduction to Digital Motion X-Ray, Part 3, How I Read a DMX Study. I'm Dr. Mike Winberry. So far, we've gone over the nuts and bolts of the DMX study, its diagnostic validity, and the pathologies it can reveal. The purpose of this unit is to show you how it's all put together in a report. The process of measurement and interpretation of findings is very logical and understanding it will be instructive to you as to how to communicate the information to patients, other doctors, and attorneys. The focus of this unit is on how you arrive at diagnosis codes which accurately describe the ligament injuries and how to prove them objectively. If the patient is at my office and I'm shooting the study, I have the patient fill out an intake form, even though I've already received all the patient's demographic information on the referral forms filled out by the referring doctor. This way, I can get some additional information, such as whether or not they've had an MRI. If they've had an MRI, I have them sign a request for patient information so that I can access it. While I have no patient contact other than functioning as a diagnostic center, just like the place you send your patients to for their MRIs, I do have a conversation with them while I'm orienting them for the procedure in which I ask questions about their motor vehicle collision, if they were involved in one. It's nice to know from which direction the force vector came. And I have them fill out pain drawings. I do this because I want to know where their pain is so I can correlate it with the DMX findings. Knowing where the pain is also tells me where to look during the read for possible problems. If you listen to the radiologist, they'll tell you that they prefer to have some history on the studies they read for the same reasons I just mentioned. Many times I'll do a copy and paste and place the pain drawing right into the report to emphasize a finding. I keep it pretty simple. I just ask the patient to draw a circle around the pain location and I specifically ask them not to write anything specific on the picture about their pain. For me, pain quality is not as important at this stage as the general location, and I ask them to either print or to write their name legibly so that it can be read, and I ask them to date the drawing. Okay, imagine that I just got my hands on a new DMX study to read. It didn't come off my machine, so I can't take screen captures while I read the film, so I do all of that prior to actually reading the film. The first thing I do is watch the entire video uninterrupted, which takes about three to four minutes. Then I create two files on my computer, a PowerPoint file in the patient's name entitled stills and an Excel file entitled measurements. Some stills are standard for the study while others specific to the case are inspired by the first look at the video. This is what my Excel file looks like. When I measure various parameters on the video, I need some place to put the measurements and this file serves as a placeholder for them. I open up the patient's stills file. As I read the film, I do screen captures, which I can highlight and embellish with the Word tools, and PowerPoint gives me a place to keep them for later use. The first video I work with is the flexion extension lateral projection. I make screen captures of the neutral lateral cervical, a maximum flexion lateral, and a maximum extension lateral. If I see early retrolisthesis during the nodding projection, I also make a still of that in extension. I make several copies of each of the lateral captures as potentially I may need them later. I always try to keep an unmarked original. The first projection to be evaluated is the neutral lateral cervical. I draw baselines on the inferior end plates of C2 and C7 and measure the cervical lordosis or lack thereof using the Cobb method. I measure the angle with an on-screen protractor. If the curve is S-shaped, I measure the curves in the upper and lower cervical spine separately in addition to the entire curve. Measuring the C2 baseline is a little different from the rest of the cervical vertebrae. In measuring the intersegmental angle at C2, C3, you would draw baselines on the end plates of both vertebrae and measure the angle where they intersect, but to measure the C1, C2 angle or the C2, C7 lordosis, the C2 line is drawn as shown in the radiograph. Place dots on the four corners of the C2 vertebral body. Draw lines which intersect at the center of the body. Place a dot on the middle of the C2 spinal laminar line and then draw a line through the center of the C2 vertebral body and the dot on the spinal laminar line. Extend the C2 line until it intersects with the C7 baseline and measure the angle with a protractor. I number the segments of the cervical spine on one copy of each of the three views for those who read the report who know nothing about anatomy. We call those people 
lawyers. I realize that mensuration programs like Posture Ray can do things like this for you, but I don't have that. And until I get my own reading software, this is just what I have to do. Range of motion at occiput to C2 is very important, so I draw baselines on the occiput, atlas, and axis and measure the angles in flexion and extension. If pertinent, these shots can be included in the report. Then I measure the translations and angular motion from C2 to C7 using Todd Cielo's DXD software. You end up with a printout that looks like this. DXD software also measures the AP width of the subaxial vertebral bodies and the central canal to produce Pavlov's ratio. Because DXD software doesn't compute total range of motion, either intersegmentally or grossly, the occiput to C2 measurements and the C2 to C7 measurements are combined on a range of motion chart I create in the upper right-hand corner. Levels highlighted in red are abnormal. At this point, I know which segments translate too much and which segments angulate too much or too little. I know where the fixated segments are and which ones are hypermobile and in which direction. I know if there is any paradoxical motion. I know all of this in addition to knowing if there are any rateable spinal segment injuries. Then, watching the flexion extension lateral projection, I stop the video at maximum flexion and measure the inner spinous spaces, that's spinal laminar line to spinal laminar line, with the on-screen caliper, which is calibrated prior to each use. I also usually have to run the video several times to get a sense of the opening of the spinous processes, as from neutral, the initiation of motion in the posterior elements of the spine starts at the top at occiput C1, and then on down the spine sequentially to the bottom. Any variation from this order is abnormal. Then I measure the width of the C4 superior end plate. I save all these numbers on the Excel chart for measurements, highlighting in red all those which exceed the parameters of Eubanks' formula. Then I enter all the information on a clean flexion lateral for the sake of illustration to appear later in the report. It looks like this, and I can copy and paste it into the report later. The C4 AP width and the 50% and 30% values which were computed by the Excel file appear on the graphic for easy reference. All of the interspinous measurements are listed here adjacent to their level, with an asterisk on them if they exceed the 30% standard at C2, C3, or the 50% standard from C3 to C7. Let's start with the AP open mouth view, as I do a number of different measurements so that any lateral offsets and any paraodontoid space asymmetry can be evaluated. I start with the neutral AP open mouth. In order to do any of this properly, the four inferior corners of the C1 lateral masses and the corners of the C2 lateral masses must be visible. I measure the width of both the C1 and C2 lateral masses. On the right lateral flexion AP open mouth, I measure the width of all the lateral masses again. Then I draw a vertical line parallel to the long axis of the odontoid process and measure the distance between the inferior medial corners of the C1 lateral mass, which gives me the A1 distance, and distance from the midline to the inferior corner of the right C1 lateral mass. That's the B1 measurement. The latter measurements are for computing Taniguchi's formula. I repeat the same process with the left lateral flexion AP open mouth, but this time the distance between the inferior medial corners of the C1 lateral masses is called A2, and the distance from the midline to the medial corner of the right C1 lateral mass is called B2. The lateral offset, if present, is measured bilaterally. I enter the C1 lateral offset information into the Excel sheet along with Pavlov's ratio. All C1, C2 measurements, including the lateral offsets, are entered into another Excel sheet, which can compute the percentage of C2 lateral mass narrowing, which occurs during the lateral flexions and Taniguchi's formula. The top chart is the left side of the chart, that's columns A through J, and the bottom chart is the right side of the chart, that's columns K through V. That's the only way I could show this entire line of columns on one page. At this point, I haven't started writing the report yet, but I have a good idea as to what the important findings are. 
The CRMA tells me if there is any abnormal translation or angulation or any spinal stenosis. I know if there is abnormal retrolisthesis, there will probably be neural canal stenosis. The measuring of the interspinous spaces tells me whether or not there is any posterior discal ligamentous tissue damage. The AP open mouth measurements confirm or rule out damage to the craniocervical ligaments. Other findings, such as facet diastasis, are determined by watching the video. Now on to actually reading the study. I use IDMX software, which is the interactive software which Dr. John Postlewaite includes with the Visualizer 2000 when you buy a machine. Not only does it have a process for evaluating the cervical spine, but it also has a report form for the lumbar spine, the TMJ, and the rest of the appendicular joints. With the exception of the lumbar spine, the Visualizer 2000 is adequate for visualizing all of the extremity joints. I enter a new patient, which creates a new file in the video section of my computer's library. My referral forms have a medical necessity page which mirrors this page. The boxes I check correspond to the boxes already filled out by the referring doctor. This negates the need for me to perform an examination on the patient. I click on cervical spine on the previous page and it takes me to this interactive format which systematically allows me to work through a search pattern for the reading of the video study. It starts with the neutral lateral cervical and then proceeds through the rest of the DMX projections, culminating with the AP open mouth with lateral flexion projection. Using radio buttons to open drop down boxes, the findings are recorded. Each section allows for additional information to be typed in. At the conclusion of the IDMX software, when all the information has been entered, a report is created in Word format at the touch of a button. All the findings are collected and entered into an impression section at the end of the report. When the report is created with the software interface with the DMX machine, stills can be captured and imported directly into the report. Otherwise, images can be captured with this print screen feature on any computer and pasted into the Word document. And this is where I used to sign the report and stop. Since then, I've learned to strengthen the report with medical literature references. I did this because I would get asked so often to explain things further that I just decided to go ahead and do it without being asked. I copy and paste all the pertinent information from the IDMX report and pictures from my PowerPoint stills into my own report template. I move the impressions to the beginning of the report, list the indications for the study in order to establish medical necessity, and list the DMX projections which were included in the study. Based on the research I've done over the past nine years, I've created my own Word document which contains all the additional statements I can include in the report, complete with medical literature references. I copy and paste these into the Word document wherever appropriate and the references follow them. The result is a detailed report with anywhere from six to 15 references from the medical literature which support the findings. At the completion of the report, I generate a set of ICD-10 CM diagnosis codes based on the findings. If findings slash diagnosis codes correlate with the patient's symptoms, the referring doctor should include them on his or her own diagnosis code list. Make the attorney aware of the new information about the seriousness of his or her client's condition. When you work in personal injury, the codes you use to describe your patient's injuries have to be accurate. When you do a DMX study on a patient who has undergone a whiplash event, Freeman and Katz make it obvious that on the average there will be at least seven objectively verified ligament subfailures identified. M24.28 ligament laxity refers to every one of them. M95.3 acquired deformity of the neck refers to any distortion of the neck which differs from the norm so the loss of cervical lordosis including the S-shaped curve, cervical kyphosis or pathological loss of the cervical curve qualify as acquired deformities. M35.7 hypermobility syndrome is really helpful in describing excessive intersegmental angulation in both flexion and extension when the ligament injury is not rateable as per the AMA guides. For a rateable ligament injury, the AMA guides requires a segment to move 11 degrees in excess of an adjacent segment, and furthermore, it requires the finding to be in flexion and totally ignores extension.
M53.2x2, cervical instabilities, refers to any rateable ligament injuries which are identified by the CRMA software. DXD software documents with highlights in red anything to which that would apply. M43.10, spondylolisthesis, isn't used very often, but when AOMSI is present, you can justify its use. M53.0, cervical cranial syndrome, is used when the rateable spinal ligament injuries at occiput to C2 can be demonstrated with objective evidence of ALAR and accessory ligament damage with corresponding cervical cranial symptoms. S13.4XXA and S13.8XXA cervical ligament sprains aren't codes I use very much because with the ICD-9CM system, the 847 sprain codes never got any respect from the insurance companies, even though ligament subfailure is the epitome of a cervical sprain. When the ICD-10 system was foisted on us a couple of years ago, at first I was bummed because I didn't want to deal with it, especially when I heard that the number of codes was going to be quintupled. But then I thought, look on the bright side, this means that probably there will be a separate and specific code for a moderate grade left ALR ligament injury or a high grade C4 anterior longitudinal ligament subfailure. Turns out that's not what we got. We got basically the same system as the old system. The S13.4 code is where they lumped in as one all of the upper cervical ligament injuries, so it's not specific at all. I have found codes specific for the interspinous ligaments, M48.32, and another for the facet capsule tears, M53.82. But for some reason, the interspinous ligament injury code has disappeared, so now I just use the S13.8XXA code for the interspinous ligaments. Because you can justify their use when you use DMX studies to obtain your diagnosis, use the dislocation codes to describe the cervical and lumbar spine injuries. Since medical grade subluxation is a partial dislocation, and a partial dislocation is still a dislocation, all of the prerequisite ligament damage which must occur in order for the interface between two bony surfaces to be disrupted has to happen. Shortly after the ICD-10 codes appeared, I saw an article written by Cairo Codes about which codes to use, the subluxation or the dislocation codes. My feeling about it is this. When I send in a CMS 1500 claim form and the reviewers see that my tax ID number begins with an 84 because I'm a chiropractor, when I use a subluxation code, even if it's supposed to reflect trauma, whoever reviews it will assume that I mean chiropractic subluxation. The ligament injury that I can diagnosed with a digital motion x-ray or medical grade subluxation and I want that clearly stated on the claim form. So the gist of the Cairo Codes article was that they didn't really know which code to use so go with the one you think you can defend. I think I can defend the use of the dislocation codes anytime as long as I have documentation from CRMA software that the segment has a rateable ligament injury. Anyway, these are the cervical dislocation codes. If you've taken Jim Mathis's seminar, you know this, insurance companies are only interested in injury diagnosis codes and are far less interested in symptom codes. Injury codes are listed on the claim form in order of severity, and if you have room, you can put the symptom codes at the end. When I put together my list of diagnosis codes at the conclusion of reading a DMX study, I always include the symptom codes, which are logical. By that I mean that it would be implausible to have a patient with a bunch of torn ligaments in their neck and not have muscle pain, a headache, and neck pain. The list of diagnosis codes generated by the DMX report is a great place to begin explaining to a patient, another doctor, an attorney, or a jury just what is wrong with the patient. We're going to go through a couple of case reports together, and while the diagnosis codes are important, I want to explain this one through both the diagnosis codes and the list of impressions. The insurance company or the courts will not be looking at the impressions and forming their opinions, but through the diagnosis codes. But other medical practitioners will be forming theirs through the impressions, so for that reason, I want to spend adequate time explaining them and the terminology used. On the next case, I'll do the report of findings solely through the diagnosis codes. When I first started with DMX in 2011, I found out quickly the hard way that it's important to place right at the beginning of the report the reason the study was done. The indication statement here is not generated by IDMX software. The referral form I sent to referring doctors has four pages, one of which has a checklist to establish medical necessity. 
I was being deposed one time and it turned out that the plaintiff attorney didn't send the completed referral forms to the defense and I found out about it during the deposition. I always go to depositions with a patient's complete file, which is what I always send to the plaintiff attorney. The plaintiff attorney, in turn, was supposed to send my notes to the defense as part of discovery. So he had a junior attorney working for him who prepared the packet to send to the defense. And for some reason, junior didn't think the referral forms were important, so he didn't include them. So when I was asked why I did the DMX on the patient, I replied that because medical necessity had been established by the referring doctor as a result of filling out the form for me. I was shocked when they couldn't find the form in their copy of the notes. I offered to show them what I had, but they refused because it was supposed to be included in discovery. It worked out okay, but it was a problem that really didn't need to be a problem. So now I don't put out a report without establishing the medical necessity at the beginning of the report. The rule is, is that if it doesn't show up in the notes, it never happened. I received the following DMX study from my friend Dr. Peterson digitally, so everyone involved has to be mentioned during the technique statement. The technique is described in the rest of the section, listing the projections included in the study. This is a list of the clinical impressions. Impressions are findings, not formal diagnoses. In IDMX software, these appear at the conclusion of the report. It made more sense to me to place them at the beginning of the report so that the reader could at a quick glance see the extent of the patient's injuries. IDMX software generates a report which identifies specific ligaments as injured in response to choices made in the interpretive section, such as posterior longitudinal ligament damage when there is posterior widening of the disc space or anterolisthesis. As my friend Dr. Yagorji explained to me, listing specific ligaments as injured is fine when the only reader is a chiropractor, but when the case needs to be referred on to a neurosurgeon, the neurosurgeon doesn't speak that language. He speaks AMA language, which describes injuries which require surgery. In this list, loss of motion segment integrity or alteration of motion segment integrity is language taken right out of the AMA guide for the evaluation of permanent impairment, sixth edition, and the modifiers mild to low grade, medium or moderate grade, and severe or high grade inform as to the severity of the finding. The details relating to the specific finding and the specific spinal level can be found in the body of the report. Since AOMSI only applies to the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments, the term cannot be applied to any other ligaments. Damage to the facet capsules is referred to as biomechanical ligamentous subfailure or failure, and it's obvious to the reader which ligament is being identified. In application to the facet joints, the term failure would only be applied to perched facets. In the craniocervical section, the identification of the failure of specific ligaments is still somewhat controversial, but the manifestation of the damage is not. Lateral offset of C1 on C2 and or asymmetrical periodontoid spaces are the obvious biomarkers, but the description of the effect is called dynamic lateral instability. There are other descriptors in the lexicon and they are listed here for your reference. For case one, this is the list of diagnosis codes which was generated by the reading of the DMX study. I include them in the patient package delivered to the insurance company, doctor, or attorney as a separate document. Now as stated, Ligamentous laxity will apply to all the findings. The first two impressions refer to abnormal translations or angular motion in the subaxial spine. So in addition to seeing them on the video, the CRMA data is invaluable in establishing the findings intersegmentally. Note that the established abnormal range for vertebral translation is 0.60 to 3.5 millimeters, and that all of the total translations, highlighted in red, fall into the range. None of them exceed 3.5 millimeters. The, the percentage of translation was recorded in the far right column, but notice that none of them exceed 20%. So none of these findings are rateable, but they are still abnormal. The range for translation comes from a 2001 article by Lynn et al in which 75 normal subjects showed average changes in George's line of less than 0.60 millimeters from maximum extension to flexion. Since White and Panjabi decided that greater than 3.5 millimeters translation was the upper limit of the acceptable range, the 0.60 millimeter 
to 3.5 millimeter range was created. Anything above 3.5 millimeters is considered to be a rateable ligament injury. The hypermobility syndrome diagnosis comes from the values recorded at C3 to C6 on the lower chart, C3, C4, C4, C5, and C5, C6 all exceed 11 degrees during extension. Eleven degrees is considered to be the upper threshold for angulation in the cervical spine. Some authors put it lower than that. Lynn et al. felt that the threshold should be as low as seven degrees, and the AMA guides put it at ten degrees. Now watch the video. Before it activates, note the smooth contour of George's line, which appears to remain almost intact from beginning to end. This is a good illustration of why you must measure. Otherwise, subtle deviations will go unnoticed. DXD software measures the width of the vertebral bodies and the width of the central canal at each level to produce Pavlov's ratio. This is a serious complicating factor in this case. The C7 stenosis is particularly worrisome not only because it is only 0.61, but this is the anatomical location of the stellate ganglion. The importance of spinal stenosis is illustrated by Steele's rule of threes. The rule of threes is the key to understanding the impact spinal stenosis has on the space available for the cord. This drawing from White and Panjabi illustrates the rule of threes as applied to the C1, C2 level. The odontoid process takes up one third of the space in the central canal. The spinal cord takes up another one third of the space in the central canal. The other one third of the space in the canal is the combination of the gap between the odontoid process and the spinal cord, which takes up one sixth of the space, and the gap between the spinal cord and the posterior arch of the atlas, which takes up another one sixth of the space. So two sixths equals one third. So the rule of threes refers to three spaces, each of which takes up one third of the space available for the cord. C1, C2 is the only level in the cord which has an odontoid process taking up space, but the drawing is demonstrative of what the space around the spinal cord looks like for the rest of the subaxial spine. This T2 weighted axial view of a congenital stenosis in the lumbar spine illustrates what the cord looks like when there is no space between the cord and the walls of the central canal. And in this particular example, there is really no soft tissue hypertrophy further closing down the space. The bottom line, there's not a lot of room for vertebrae to be moving back and forth. That's why the concept of George's line is so important. When the interface between the central canals of two adjacent vertebrae are disrupted and anterolisthesis or retrolisthesis happens, it constitutes a guillotine mechanism and in certain positions it can worsen, limiting the space available for the cord. Consider this illustration over the next few slides. The circle represents the central canal of two vertebral levels on an axial view and the gray blob represents the spinal cord. As long as the two levels stay lined up, there is plenty of space available for the cord and you can't tell one vertebra from another. With ligamentous disruption, two vertebral levels are now clearly visible and the space available for the cord is being compromised. With further displacement, the spinal cord is further compromised. And when spinal stenosis is part of the scenario, the situation is potentially worse. This is the guillotine mechanism as pictured by White and Panjabi. Note that the odontoid process has fractured and been displaced away from the C2 vertebral body. It used to be right here. The transverse ligament remains intact, allowing the entire atlas to translate forward so that the spinal cord is pinched between the posterior arch of the atlas and the posterior aspect of the C2 vertebral body. Not good.
The next impressions, number four, number five, and number six, pertain to the status of the ligaments of the facet joints. Once again, the diagnosis of ligamentous laxity is applicable to all three impressions. Since it's the facet joints which are involved, M53.82 cervical facet syndrome is an appropriate diagnosis, but the referring doctor needs to correlate these findings with the sclerotogenous pain referral chart, which is included in the report, and or refer the patient to a pain management specialist who can do the challenge with medial branch blocks and prove the involvement of the facet joint capsules. S13.4XXA is a ligament sprain diagnosis and I add it to cover all my bases and leave no doubt in anyone's mind that there is multiple level ligament damage in the cervical spine. Number four indicates that there is pathological gapping of the facet joint at C5-C6 on the left. Note that the facet articular processes at C5-C6 lose their parallel alignment in the maximally flexed position. For comparison, look at the adjacent facet joints and note that they have good parallel alignment. The C6-C7 facet joint looks bad on the still, but if you watch it closely, you'll see that it barely moves and only looks bad because of overlying structures. The evaluation of facet capsule damage is somewhat subjective, but I would rate this as moderate grade damage with the caveat that I wouldn't rate any capsular ligament damage as severe or high grade unless the facets were perched. Next, number five indicates that the hypermobility noted on the left at C4, C5, and C5, C6 results in mild foraminal encroachment. So I'll activate the video, watch until full extension is achieved, and I'll pause it. Note the decreased size of the intervertebral foramina from C4 to C6, and watch as the superior articulating facet of the inferior vertebra protrudes into the foramen, separating slightly from the inferior articulating facet of the superior vertebrae. I rate this as a low-grade biomechanical ligamentous subfailure. Number six refers to the AP lower cervical view in which there is bilateral gapping in the articular pillars at all levels between C3 and C7. There is evidence of an old compression fracture of the articular pillar on the left at C6 as the bone is roughly 60% of the height of the corresponding structure on the right. It's right here. When the video activates, See that it is at it is at C5, C6 on the left where the gapping is the greatest. C4, C5 is almost as bad. The patient does not have an extreme anterior weight-bearing posture of the head which would bring the facet joints to the horizontal and produce a false positive finding of facet capsular damage. I rate these findings as moderate to high-grade biomechanical ligamentous subfailure. Number seven has already been covered in several places in the previous two hours, but in this case, the asymmetry of the paraodontoid spaces as revealed by application of Taniguchi's formula was more important than the lateral offsets of C1 on C2. Once again, the diagnosis of ligamentous laxity is more than appropriate as the dislocation code for C1-C2 is being used for reasons already explained. As noted in the indications listed on the first page of the report, Cognitive symptoms are part of the patient's problem, so craniocervical syndrome is also listed. All right, now I'll start the video and watch the patient move to the right first, which shows the lateral offset, but not much in the way of asymmetry of the paraodontoid spaces. But with left lateral flexion, the paraodontoid spaces change radically, and doing the math resulted in a Taniguchi score of 18.96% which is consistent with high-grade dynamic lateral instability of C1-C2. Referral to a neurosurgeon for evaluation is strongly recommended in cases like this.
Now, with case number two, we'll use the diagnosis codes as the guide to what's in the report. Once again, the report starts with the establishment of medical necessity and a description of the study technique. I use Metasoft as a billing software, and this is a page it produces which lays out the diagnosis codes as I place them in the various boxes. As you know, the CMS 1500 form now has 12 slots for diagnosis codes, so it's important to place them into the boxes in order of importance. Notice that instead of calling it default diagnosis one, the software calls ligamentous laxity the principal diagnosis, which indeed it is. So let's look at that first. Look no further than the list of impressions. As explained before, each of these is specific for a set of ligamentous injuries. So the use of M24.28 is entirely justified. The second most important code in the dislocation of C1, C2, meaning that we're looking at pathological lateral offsets of C1 on C2 and or asymmetrical paraodontoid spaces. We go to the section in the report where it says, there is significant abnormal lateral translation of C1 on C2 with an overhang bilaterally. The lateral translational displacement of C1 on C2 is measured at 28% on the left and 37% on the right. However, these findings are accompanied by a greater than 10% reduction in the width of the adjacent C2 lateral masses, so it's not likely that these findings are representative of high-grade ALAR and accessory ligament lesions. Greater than 20% translation indicates severe damage to the craniocervical ligaments, right? So why do I mention the narrowing of the width of the C2 lateral masses? The truth is that when the AP open mouth is done with lateral flexions, the atlas rotates only a few barely perceptible degrees. But the rotation of C2 while the atlas laterally flexes is more exuberant than the rotation induced by normal rotation of the cervical spine. With pure rotation of C1 on C2, C1 rotates about 23 degrees before the rotation of C2 begins. Because of the normal laxity of the C1-C2 articular capsule, a true physiological dislocation is allowed as the articular surfaces of C1 and C2 lose their proximity to one another, as illustrated by this old drawing from the 1950s. It was true then and it's true now. And oh, by the way, it was these guys, Jacobson and Adler, who first coined the term offsets. To depict the normal biomechanics that occur with left lateral flexion of C1, just take the drawing from the Jacobson and Adler article and rotate the picture 90 degrees to the left, which places the atlas in the neutral position as it would be on an AP open mouth projection, with the spinous process of the axis rotated contralaterally to the right. The red arrow represents an X-ray beam moving from anterior to posterior. If you watch any DMX AP open mouths, you'll see the spinous process of C2 rotate exactly as it's pictured here, narrowing the width of the contralateral C2 lateral mass and creating that massive offset or overhang. And this wasn't news in 1956. 24 years earlier, Dr. Kutz described it. Moreover, whenever rotation is present, the second cervical vertebrae is foreshortened in the anteroposterior view, giving the appearance of lateral displacement to one or both sides. In 1964, Hole and Baker did a study in which they artificially restricted the rotation of C2 during lateral flexion of C1 and noted that no lateral offset of C1 on C2 was produced. They concluded that a physiological lateral shift of the atlas on the axis of as much as four millimeters can occur normally because of the coupled motion of rotation and lateral bending. So, because of that, the finding of lateral offset of C1 on C2 has to be taken with a grain of salt. That's why, when I measure the AP open mouth projection, I include the C2 lateral masses in all three positions and I calculate their percentage of narrowing and take that into account when determining the importance of the offset. Dr. Yagorji doesn't like to take the offset seriously if the percentage of narrowing of the C2 lateral masses exceeds 10%. And I think that makes sense in light of the information which can be gained with Taniguchi's formula. Significant change is noted at the paraodontoid spaces bilaterally. Asymmetrical paraodontoid spaces are clinically significant because hypermobility at the atlantoaxial joint can reduce blood flow in the contralateral vertebral artery. The integrity of the alar and accessory ligaments can be evaluated by comparative measurement of the paraodontoid spaces.
According to Taniguchi's formula, the patient has a low to moderately unstable craniocervical junction with a score of 10.6% uh, and greater than 15.1% would equal high-grade dynamic lateral instability. Lesions to the alar and accessory ligaments typically cause suboccipital pain and frontal headaches. Because these findings correlate well with her pain drawings and she has cognitive symptoms, I can agree with the moderate dynamic lateral instability at C1-C2 and include the dislocation code for C1-C2 and craniocervical syndrome on her diagnosis list. Because of the cognitive symptoms, I include this paragraph. The instability at the C1-C2 level is known to produce the craniocervical syndrome, which in addition to producing headaches and neck pain also produces what Dr. Joel Frank, MD, a neurosurgeon in Tampa, Florida, calls bizarre when he describes the constellation of symptoms which are associated with this, which include poor concentration, diminished memory, tinnitus, ataxia, nausea and vomiting, autonomic disturbances, paresthesia, weakness, and chronic pain. The last one, chronic pain, is especially interesting because by most conservative estimates, more than 20% of all patients with neck injury develop fibromyalgia syndrome shortly after a motor vehicle collision, and that's 3.2 months on the average. Other authors state that the incidence is much higher. Back to the diagnosis codes list. The next diagnosis is M53.2X2, or cervical instabilities. Now, while this code would logically include the C1-C2 findings, this is included for a different reason. The flexion lateral and extension lateral findings appear on pages 3 to 7 of the report in sections 3 and 4. While the CRMA report did reveal abnormal findings in translation and angular motion, there were no rateable findings which would cause me to use a dislocation code. But in flexion, there is a combination of things which is significant. In addition, the combination of anterolisthesis, increased angulation, widening of the posterior intervertebral disc space, excessive distraction of the facet joints, and excessive separation between the spinous processes, all at the same level, has been described by numerous authors as anterior subluxation or hyperflexion sprain. Patient Z has all of these findings at C5, C6. Dr. Harris's use of the term subluxation refers to the medical sense of the word, incomplete or partial dislocation, because of the extent of the ligamentous injury and not the chiropractic sense of the word. Note the extent of the injury involved in a hyperflexion sprain. George's line is badly broken and the disc is ruptured and extruded its contents, indicating disruption of both the posterior annular fibers and the posterior longitudinal ligament. Likewise, the facet capsule and the inner spinous ligaments are torn, and even though it's not depicted, ligamentum flavum and the nuchal ligament also have to be compromised. I bring this up because this illustrates one of the weakness of the AMA guides in determining permanent impairment. Anterior subluxation or hyperflexion sprain is a severe deforming spinal injury, but the possibility exists that medical legally it may not constitute a rateable injury. If the translation doesn't exceed 3.5 millimeters or if the angulation is not 11 degrees greater than an adjacent level, which is the case for this patient, then the patient is not worthy of an impairment rating. But she will surely experience future impairment as we know that multiple injuries to the ligaments add up to a poor healing response for all the ligaments while a single ligament injury has a much better chance of healing. The development of post-traumatic arthritis is almost assured for the C5-C6 intersegmental level. And that segues nicely into the next diagnosis, which is S13.8XXA, a ligament sprain code which is nonspecific, but which I like to apply to the damage to the posterior discal ligamentous tissue. This is part of the hyperflexion sprain, but it can be a standalone finding all by itself. Eubanks' formula is applied to the patient's maximum flexion still with the following paragraph included in the report. There is damage to the interspinous ligaments from C2 to C7, indicated by excessive spreading between the spinous processes as per Eubanks' formula, which stated is, if the distance between the spinal laminar lines from C3 to T1 is greater than 50% of the AP width of the C4 superior end plate on the lateral projection, the interspinous ligaments have been damaged, and that's 30% for C2, C3. Three contiguous segments with excessive widening between the spinous processes is considered to be a sign of instability. Eubanks' formula has two criteria, the second being a 
greater than two millimeter difference in the inner spinous distance between two contiguous levels, which is found between C3, C4, and C4, C5. Since excessive spreading of the spinous processes can cause damage not only to the inner spinous ligaments, but also to all the ligaments anterior to them, up to and including the posterior annular fibers, this constitutes evidence of severe posterior discal ligamentous tissue damage and a follow-up cervical MRI is recommended. These findings are accompanied by the flexion lateral still, which is marked with the interspinous space findings. Both of Eubanks' criteria are met in this analysis. All of the levels marked with an asterisk exceed the C4 end plate internal standard, and there is greater than 2 millimeters difference between C3 and C4 and C4, C5, so this can rightly be called severe posterior discal ligamentous tissue damage. In addition, there are five continuous segments with abnormal widening of the interspinous spaces, and you only need three, which is an indication of spinal instability. Since the findings correlate well with the pain drawings, the appropriate pain drawing is also included in the report. The last three pain diagnoses, myalgia, vascular headache, and cervicalgia, are all symptoms of the ligament injuries and need to be explained as such. The pain drawings are extremely helpful for that. The next diagnosis is M53.82, cervical facet syndrome, and this patient has an ample supply of facet capsule injuries. There are three places on the study where descriptions of said injuries are found, the flexion and extension obliques and the AP lower cervical with lateral flexions. This is the right posterior oblique, which shows significant gapping of the facet joints on the left at C4, C5, and C5, C6. Watch the mid-cervical spine facet joints at full flexion, and you'll see significant gapping by the third rep. So I'll freeze it, turn on the pointer, and point that out to you. Here's three, four, five, and six. So here's four, five, and five, six. Four, five is distracted, five, six is distracted, and spread wide. Let me activate this again. And note that on extension, the intervertebral foramina are wide open with no hypermobility or encroachment. A still demonstrating the injuries is copied and pasted into the report and embellished with arrows. As this patient is a young, thin-necked female, the articular pillars are easily viewed and with the lateral flexions, the intersegmental gapping is demonstrated well. To help illustrate the injuries, in addition to screen capture stills, a pain referral chart and a copy of the patient's pain drawing are included with a statement that the findings correlate well with the patient's symptoms. If appropriate, a causation statement can be placed at the conclusion of the report with reference to Freeman and Katz. Knowing that this kind of report can be kind of overwhelming, I include the ligament injury summary just to put it all in a nutshell for the referring doctor so that they can get it into their minds as to where the injuries are. Looking at this concurrently with the range of motion chart can be extremely helpful. 
The range of motion chart is always found at the conclusion of the extension section after the discussion of the flexion and extension findings. Not only does the range of motion chart highlight where the biomechanical problems lie, it constitutes a reason for initiation of chiropractic intervention. And if that's ongoing, then the obvious faults become a reason for continuation of treatment. And if this is what a patient looks like upon release, then making the case for permanent injury is pretty easy. Normal people just don't look like this. And I say that because this is a highly informative range of motion chart, but more so on a clinical level than on a medical legal level. By that I mean is that the situation at C5 to C7, it's difficult to describe with diagnosis codes. Hypomobility syndrome would cover it, but there's no code for that, even though there used to be one with the ICD-9 system. The hypomobility at C5 to C7 is in sharp contrast from the hypermobility seen at C3 to C5, which may be a compensation for that hypomobility. C5 to C7 is so screwed up that it's exhibiting paradoxical motion in flexion at C5, C6, and in extension at C6, C7. And this is the profile of a young lady in her early 20s with a thin neck who was injured five months prior to the study and has undergone extensive chiropractic treatment. This study was done on my machine before I went to Denmark and learned about the C7 fixation, but it's my gut feeling that the spinal adjustment at C7 would probably change everything. Which brings us back full circle to the very beginning. The first step in getting a patient well is getting the diagnosis right. To do that, you have to do the right examination, including the diagnostic modalities. If you get the diagnosis wrong, the patient doesn't get well. It's as simple as that. With all the information you need, it isn't that hard in determining exactly what's wrong with a patient. DMX studies provide invaluable biomechanical information that other diagnostic modalities simply can't provide. DMX studies do not replace MRI or CT, nor does MRI or CT replace DMX, but they are ancillary to one another, providing a complete diagnostic picture of the patient.